watched a lot of interviews of you talking about the 35th anniversary of Hairspray, and none of the interviews are going to have someone else like myself that was in the movie. In and the I, movie. <laughs> I just wanted to talk about the part that you cast me in. Well, <laughs> who knows? Look at him. He went from being cast as the creep, <laughs> was the name of the character, into a very successful <laughs> businessman, producer, everything here in Hollywood. So we picked the right people, yes. didn't we? Yes. Stick with us, kid, and we'll make you claw your way to the top. You were a great friend with Brooke, who yeah. practically I helped raise, you know, Brooke and Greer, Pat's son. And so that's why you got the part, but you were good. You were good in it. And as you told me coming over, there were only two people. You want to tell the audition story? <laughs> yeah, I want story? to tell the story. They put me in front of you with another kid. And the first thing you do is you talk to the first kid and you all you did was ask one question. You looked at the kid and you go, have you ever acted before? And he said, no. And I'm thinking, wrong answer. <laughs> so you say to me, have you ever acted before? And of course I said, yes. And then you're like, you've got the part. Well. <laughs> I could tell, yes. I could tell. So you kind of bring me over to Leslie Ann, who's playing Penny Pendleton. You tell us the scene and then you leave and we're talking amongst ourselves about, you know, doing the scene. And she literally like looks at me and she's like, if you try to kiss me for real, I'm gonna kick you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. The funny part was you made Chucky or whoever put fake pimples on me, which you can't see in the movie, but well, for real is kind of little, I <laughs> little. think, you know. I mean, the creep had to be a little bit like Penny wouldn't want him yeah, to yeah. ask for the dance. <laughs> you were too cute. So later, by the way, Baltimore never carded any teenager in their life at this time of history. If they were with us. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sitting at the bar, the Club Charles, and you come in and you sit down next to me and you'd been editing, like you were pretty close to finishing the film. And you sit down next to me and you go, Jeff, Jeff, you didn't get cut out. You're not on the cutting room floor. And it's a great scene. You're going to be a star. <laughs> <laughs> well, look what you went on to. I'm not going to be a star. Like, this isn't going to make me a star. It so, gave you the confidence yeah. to do everything yeah. else you wanted to do, which you had anyway. I kind of knew I wanted to be in film already. And originally, when I was younger, I kind of was thinking acting, but I, by that point, I actually wanted to make films. I just wanted to be on set because I was like, this is my... That's how you learn. Yeah, this Everything. is my opportunity, yeah. this yeah. is what I want to do. So, years later, <laughs> Saturday Night Live does a short film that you're in, and it's called The Creep, It's a Dance. Hi, I'm John Waters, and this is The Creep. When you're out at a club and you see a fly girl do the creep, you eventually did an interview about that, and you said in the interview, yeah, in the movie there was this guy, and I still know him, and it's called The, the Creep. creep. <laughs> the Creep is yeah. like, it's just a catchy little name the, to be the, known as. The Creep has its own life. <laughs> so why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, Corny. I'm Tracy Turnblad, and I go to Mervo High. <laughs> This is really like a biopic. It's really about your life and how you lived through most of these things. And because it became your crossover movie, as everyone says, there's a childhood like sweetness, you know, to yeah, it. But I gave it a happy ending. Yeah. And it's, In the real life, the show went off the air because yeah. it didn't integrate. People came just to Baltimore to do the Buddy Dean show. Every single major star came to Buddy Dean except Elvis. And they all lip sync. They just played the record, and the girls with the big hair stood around and clapped while they lip synced the song. We didn't have American Bandstand with Dick Clark. We were the only city that didn't have it. We had the local version where the girls' hairs were higher, the boys' pants were tighter. These kids were huge stars in Baltimore, but they got beat up when they went out too because they were hated or loved, depending if you were in a working class neighborhood or a fancy neighborhood. Yeah. Did you dance to it when, as a kid? I was on? on the Buddy Dean show twice with Mary Vivian Pierce both times, but they threw us off because we did the Dirty Boogie, the one thing you weren't allowed to do. They didn't have black committee though. It was only once every couple weeks and they had Fat Daddy, who was the best DJ in Baltimore, who wore a crown and he had a song, Fat Daddy is Santa Claus. It was a huge hit in Baltimore. And all the kids, black and white, listened to him. So how it finally got integrated, the white kids crashed Black Day and got on. They weren't expecting that. And then they just pulled the plug on the whole show because it was 1964 and everything, was hippies, rap, it just was a different time. And overnight, girls had teased big hair and then they went flat, they ironed her hair. Overnight, it changed. And if you had teased hair, you were out of fashion. The show went off the air. But around that time, Governor Wallace, the racist governor, was running in the primary in Baltimore. And I went to the demonstrations. So it was the first time I ever felt civil disobedience and everything. 
So it was my story. I used to go downtown with my friends, and we lived in an upper middle class suburban neighborhood. All the bad kids in that neighborhood, we went downtown to be beatniks, and we met the gay world, and we all hung around together. So to me, in hindsight, I don't think I was thinking this consciously at the time. Yes, it was me being gay, because a gay was an outsider. Ricky, being a big girl, stood for every kind of outsider. And so all this was based on some kind of memory. But there was never a big girl on the Buddy Bean Show, ever. And Mary Lou, who in real life was Amber, and in real life her mother was Edna, said that a big girl never even auditioned, not one ever came down. And even when we had auditions for My Hairspray, not that many came. When it finally was an NBC four versions later and they had an open audition, thousands of big girls stood in line to audition. And that's because Ricky made it great. She was bubbly, she was exciting, she was fun. She was Tracy Turnblad in some ways, completely. I saw you on TV, I want you to be my model. Would, uh, would she be paid for this? One free outfit a month. You start tomorrow. I hope there's no diets in the works because I want to design your Miss Otto show coronation gown myself. There's something really interesting about the movie, you know, the fact that it's this biopic essentially, which I don't think most people really understood. And it is very serious. It's a political it's movie serious. without anyone preaching. It, I don't think anybody thinks they're getting preached at. It's not woke fat girl goes on dance show, even though that is what it is. You want people to agree with you, make them laugh. They'll listen. You don't make them feel stupid. Racists like Hairspray. Oh. But they're so stupid they don't realize <laughs> no, it's making course. fun of them and they like the movie. That means I won the first round of debates. It's a really, really amazing movie how you kind of slipped it in there. I mean, I know you were surprised, you know, about the PG, you know, rating. I mean, talk a little bit about how. Well, I knew when it got a PG rating, I was shocked. A new line even was shocked. They said, say the word shit in it so we get a PG-13. I said, no, that means nothing. That we have a PG is shocking. That's a news story right there. I didn't plan on that. But to this day, it's kind of amazing that it was. And I just figured, well, Divine's in it, they'll give us an R, you know, just because of me or whatever. But it is a movie the whole family should be able to see. It is a movie that encourages interracial dating. Two men sing a love song to each other in it. There are people that are against this for, of course, kids, as if it's gonna catch on them, you know. Which I always think it's good if it does. You know? Yeah, the story is incredibly universal. And talk then a little bit about Divine. Well, He's Divine for the first time got great reviews because he had established himself as the thing that we made up to scare hippies, basically, like Godzilla meets Elizabeth Taylor. And the press knew all him, but he was in any of these outrageous movies. When he did the opposite in Polyester playing an alcoholic housewife, he started to get great reviews. And then in Hairspray, he played a frumpy mother. And he even said the first day on the set, what drag queen would allow themselves to look like this? Originally, when I pitched the movie, Divine was going to play Tracy and the mother, like the parent trap. But Bob Shea said, no, <laughs> no. Divine was used to being the star, and Ricky had the biggest part in it, certainly. They made friends very, very quickly, though. And I think Divine taught Ricky how to walk in heels. He did everything. So they had a mother-daughter relationship, pretty much, in the film, for real. So when the movie came out, he got really great reviews. And at least he saw them. He died a few days later, but he was in LA. He was playing like a gay uncle on Married with Children, which would have been controversial at the time, but probably very successful. This neighborhood is certainly no place for a star. Now get that car before someone sees you. Sonny was the mayor, and he played a racist in a movie. But he was where he said, now, nobody's gonna come out and eat shit or anything. I mean, he thought I was tricking him that there was gonna be some scene that I hadn't told him about. I said, no, no. He was a great sport. People didn't know. He was the A&R man for Specialty Records, which was all black music, Little Richard, everything. He was one of the few white musicians that worked in soul music really, really early, before he became Sonny and Sonny and Cher or anything. So he knew Ruth Brown. He had remembered her from the early days of Rhythm and Blues. Sonny was game, he got it, he was great to work with. And I knew Debbie a little bit before because we had used some of the music in Polyester. Even today, she's a huge star that deserves every bit of it, you know? So to have her in it, we had Ruth Brown, we had uh, Pia Zadora, who at the time was made fun of a lot in the press, but I loved her and I met her at the Berlin Film Festival and wrote a great thing about what a great movie Butterfly was. Let's do some reefer. We'll get high and I'll iron the chick's hair. Reefer? Oh, drugs? 
Colleen Fitzpatrick, who was so great. She went on to become Vitamin C, the pop star. She was great. She's a music executive at Netflix. Yeah. And Buddy Dean's in it. There's a scene where he comes over to the car. And the best story I heard was that Buddy Dean finally went to see Hairspray on Broadway. We got him tickets and he said, did Dick Clark pay to see this? And we said, yeah, and he went, oh, good. He was so happy that Dick Clark had actually bought a ticket to see the Broadway show based on him because they did make a movie about American Bandstand that failed. And today I'd like to introduce a brand new dance and dedicate it to some of my special friends who, because of small-minded people, can't be here with me today. My dance is called the Waddle. That girl's got roaches in her hair. Roaches? My little Tracy's a clean teen. There's no bugs on her, baby. My parents got me on Howdy Doody. I walked in, I thought, it's all a lie. There's 10 Howdy Doody puppets. Bob or Bob's mean to me. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I knew them, that's what I wanted. I knew the magic trick. It wasn't disillusioning to me. It was exciting, aha, it's all a lie. My parents were the great gift they gave me that you can do what you want. They were horrified at what I was doing, but they didn't discourage it. They just wished I made a different kind of movie. They were so relieved when they saw Hairspray. Oh God, were they relieved. <laughs> I read about New Line. They were the first ones that had Reefer Madness and then an art film and then a karate movie. They put together some genres. So I sent them Multiple Maniacs and Bob Shea had just started. It was like five people worked there on University Place, the office. And he said, oh, come back when you have something more polished, if you can imagine. So I came back with Pink Flamingos and my life changed, you know? And they went on, they distributed many of my movies, including Hairspray. I fought with him, oh God, we had fights and everything. But God, he ended up thinking I just, without him, I would have never had a career. At the same time, Bob sent his daughter to live with us and we were making Hairspray, remember? <laughs> his daughter came. So in other words, we all were a family too, you know? I knew his wife, I knew he traveled all over the world with him. I had the cliche of signing a deal for a movie on a napkin with him happened in camp. Bob Shea and I and Sarah Wisher, who was also the executive then during those period, gave money to finance my show at the Academy Museum, you know, so they're still being there for me. And you look back, I don't know, how did I ever make those movies? How did I ever figure out how to get them distributed at all? Because I was obsessed by it, you know? I was lucky I knew what I wanted to do. Hairspray probably was the happiest experience of all the movies I made. I remember spontaneous happiness. Like on weekends when we'd have parties and just the kids would jump up and all start doing the Madison for no apparent reason. <laughs> and it was reliving my childhood, something I remembered very much, the Buddy Dean show. So it was a great moment of my life and I think the joy of making that movie came through.